Well, we've heard a lot about uh, wearable data and measuring individuals uh, directly. We also heard about genomics. But in the, in the modern world, I think genomics is only really the beginning of what we can do with omics. And our next speaker is really a pioneer in the world of proteomics uh, for cardiovascular biomarker discovery. Uh, Jenny Van Eyck is professor of medicine at Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles and directs the NHLBI Innovation Center uh, for Heart Failure. And she has really over many years pioneered and really been at the forefront of biomarker discovery through high throughput mass spectrometry approaches. Uh, and she's going to tell us a little bit more about that. And it's really my pleasure to welcome her here to Stanford and welcome her to the stage. Jen. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's my delight to be here. So we're going to actually now get to where the rubber hits the road. We're going to talk about technology and how to think about it and integrate it into some of the big dreams that you have. And if you th don't think technologists have big dreams, then you're going to walk out of here disappointed because we have very big dreams. And I work on proteins, and I think they're going to be key to understanding the diversity of each individual person. And when you can have a single protein having a single mutation or a single protein that has a phosphorylation versus an oxidation completely shut down the system, if you're not monitoring that, then you'll never actually understand your physio. physio. So my cute little title is Mobilizing Medicine or Medicine in Me and Everybody Else. So I like the word M. So in our lab, in our group, in our institute, what we think a lot about is actually the duality I want to be able to diagnose or prognose someone. But if I don't have an intervention that's going to work at the same time, then I've lost that link to how we actually improve healthcare. And it may not be a medicine that it's a drug, but if we don't link the underlying medical molecular changes for the diagnostic side and also not do that within the context of action intervention, then I think we've lost an opportunity. So we do both. I think the diagnostic side is a thousand billion times harder to do than being able to do high throughput screening and looking at these different interventions that we can do and get drugs on target, reduce side effects. Not to say that's tr not trivial, it is tri not, not easy to do, but I think biomarkers are hard because each one of us is not a single disease. We're not just cardiovascular, uh, at risk for cardiovascular. We have many, many other parts, plus we have the... Um, the, the life parts that go on, as, as the last speaker talked about, you know, this afternoon you may be super happy, so you'll be acting differently. So we are going to talk a little about, about the proteome and about the understanding that they, the proteins that you have in your body and your cell at any one time is really a reflection of your past, who you are right now, and also how you're going to respond in the future. We're going to talk about remote monitoring devices and how we're starting to use them at the proteomics and metabolomics level to start to understand wherever you live, whoever you are, whatever time and how often as you want, we can start to understand the molecular under, uh, profile of who you are over time. And I'm going to say um, accuracy is important. Data quality and analytics is very important. A change in a protein of 20%, a phosphorylation of one protein in your smooth muscle and your vasculature will cause your smooth muscle to contract. 20% change. You need that accuracy if we truly want to be able to understand the precision around what makes you you and me me. So our hypothesis for today is that if we can continuously monitor your proteome, and we're going to do this in blood, um, that maybe we can understand more of what's going on with the rise and fall of your disease state. And maybe if we can do that, we can improve our diagnosis, being able to make healthcare better. So why would remote monitoring work? So why is it if we can take a drop of blood from someone, anywhere, anytime, you send it to me, and we can accurately provide to you clinical grade assays? Does that not sound kind of familiar? Well, it does. It is a good business, but the reality is that it can be done. It can be done truthfully, accurately, um, and it's only going to get better. Um, so why you want to be able to do, do remote monitoring is we have lots of ways we've been talking about today, and I think throughout the, to do with how we intervene at the clinician level within the context of a hospital system. But we can also understand more about the human natural disease progression. We can start to combine it with other things. And again, proteins and metabolites are always closest to the drugs. Now I'm going to give you two examples. One is our ability to look at very early atherosclerosis. We heard about that earlier. And also MACE, which is major adverse uh, cardiac outcomes, stroke, heart attacks, hospitalization. So remote monitoring is very 
um, easy to understand. If we could do it, we can actually get to subpopulations. You hear about that a lot within the context of precision medicine. But you can also track individuals over time. They become their own standard. And deviations from what their own standards are will be a sign that there needs to be some kind of intervention, even if that intervention is maybe you should go see your doctor. But you need to be able to have ease to be able to do remote monitoring. It has to be very easy to do, reproducible, reliable, and equal to clinical grade assays. So we're doing this uh, right now. There's lots of different devices you can use. We're working with a company called Neoteryx, but there's lots of very cool technology coming down. Conceptually, it's all the same. So we work with this uh, device called Mitra, and it um, accurately wicks out 10 microliters of blood. So you prick your finger, you do a draw, uh, draw a little blop of blood, it will wick out exactly 10 microliters. They have other size devices. We use the 10 microliter. It is blood, it's not plasma, it's whole blood. There's different ones out there for plasma. And what that allows you to do is you then dry it and send it to us through the mail or drop it off, whatever you want, and we're able to analyze it. So it's been around for a long time, not that long actually, though the concept's been around for a long time for small molecules, but no one's been really doing proteins, or in our case, peptides, which represent those proteins. So the ability to be able to do these dried um, reagents um, is that you can essentially just mail them. Um, they're stable as long as you have your standards in there, and we'll talk about that. So we've looked at standards within the tip itself, standards uh, to be able to assess the quality of the assays and the, and the reagents and the actual blood sample in our lab. So there's me, I'm not good with blood, I faint very easily, but this is actually pretty simple. And we've now, um, in a uh, California Precision Medicine grant, we're now employing this into uh, a group of cohorts and we'll talk about it. So we automate everything in our lab. If it's automatable, we will try to do this. So we worked with Beckman Colt to develop an automation sample uh, prep for mass spectrometry. And we use this for both discovery as well as for clinical, essentially allowing t us to do 96 samples in what used to take us about a week and a half in about two and a half hours hours with CVs uh, well below 10%. And essentially we put these tips in and then we put it through and we're going to digest all our proteins. And that allows the peptides to easily get out of these devices. That's why they're mass spectrometry based assays and not necessarily ELISA based assays. So mass spectrometry uh, sample prep is many, many steps and having QC along all of that part is very important to make sure that it's what comes in comes out and you actually know that. Um, it is actually on par, if not more accurate than many of the clinical assays assays that we use, like cardiac troponin I, a protein I love. Um, so we've automated all of this, and um, we started to use a plex. This is a, a small plex for us, so this means we're looking at only 10 proteins, but they're great proteins because they're proteins that represent key elements of health. So we have some of the apolipoproteins, ApoA, ApoB, which is, has often been shown to be better than the lipid panel. We have cystatin C, kidney marker. We have ApoL1, which is the variance for if you're African American, you are more risk of developing kidney disease and heart disease. We have um, control cystatin C, as I mentioned, and also CRP. And each of those beeps that you see in that graph is actually a peptide that's unique to that protein. It's not any peptide. It's a peptide that's very special that we've been able to show is very stable. It's not going to break down if you put some blood in the middle of Texas on a tarmac or whether or not you forget and you leave it out for five days and forget to mail it into us. So these are very unique peptides. They're very stable. We add internal standards in each one. So we have quantitation, absolute quantitation on these analytes. And we run them. So we do things like short-term and long-term stability of the blood in these samples. Whether or not we can store them at minus 80, which turns out to be what you should do once you get them in the lab. Whether or not hemocrit matters. Does that change how much blood you're actually drawing out? And whether or not we have the technical part of the sample processing. So all of this was worked out. Um, and the CVs, when we do it ourselves, one person does it many times or multiple people do it many times, the CVs come in as well as a clinical assay. And I'm also, uh, current QC we're doing is we're actually adding a protein at, in the tip itself so we can know whether or not there's been a problem from the time you've taken the sample to the delivery to us in the lab. So the first study I'll talk about is really this California Precision Medicine Grant. It's done with uh, Brennan and uh, Noel. Again, you have to have teams to be able to do this type of science. And essentially, we said we wanted to be able to monitor patients over time to see whether or not they would develop um, MACE, whether or not they would have a major um, adverse outcome. 
And essentially, what we did is we took a mid-risk population, not a high-risk, but a mid-risk individual. So these individuals over 10 years will have about a 20% chance of having an MI or something like that. And we wanted to integrate the biomarkers, so the molecular phenotyping, with the biosensors, with PRO, so patient-reported outcomes. And, of course, my part, which I love, is the proteins. And what you can see there is we're measuring classic proteins in a single plex as well as in our discovery plex, which is over 600, around 600 proteins that we will be monitoring. And then we can also do small molecules at the same time. So what you're able to do is very targeted assay, and you're able to do this discovery at the same time. So we're doing this, and we're, uh, it's very smart. It wasn't my idea. It was very smart. It's to actually recruit people through the rehab at uh, Cedar sinai and um, very motivated individuals, and then they're taking their blood samples over time. So these are two of our plexes. I just want to get you an idea. So people talked about wellness. So our, our small 72 protein plex is a wellness plex. It monitors the major things you need to worry about. It has lipids, lipid metabolism, atherosclerosis indicators. It has inflammation, immune system. It has heart, lung, kidney. And if you're monitoring those proteins over time in individuals, you get to understand their flex and whether or not there's a change. Our discovery protein, again, flex is um, about just under 600 proteins, 400 of them have CVs equivalent to clinical chemistry tests. So all these studies that you hear of people jump over proteomics, they shouldn't be. We're not just a few analytes. Proteomics is there, we're doing high throughput. So now you have to say, well, where do you get all these new discoveries? How can you actually find out stuff? So some of it is just monitoring people over time. We have a large initiative at Cedars to do that. Um, my hope is everyone coming into Cedars will be monitoring them um, over time using Mitra-like devices. But you can also do it in coming from basic science. And this has been a hard gap from really understanding people come up with thousands of papers saying, I have a new biomarker, but it's never been validated in large cohorts. And so there's a very hard translation across it. So we're, we're starting two new labs at Cedar sinai to help uh, change that gap, and one of the driving forces is this particular panel. So we wanted to be able to look for early atherosclerosis. This is a collaboration with David Harrington and also um, uh, Joseph Wang out of uh, Virginia Tech. And we wanted to take aortas from individuals who are very young. And so we're doing it out of New Orleans. And then look at them using proteomics to find out whether or not we could classify them across a range. Now remember, these individuals aren't very sick but they do have some fatty streak and some vulnerable plaque, fibrous plaque. So we were able to do that, we went on, and from that we looked at, we had essentially great set of markers to come out on the pathological signatures for the tissue. We took those which are secreted and we started to analyze them. And this is just really the beginning, but already you can see our rock curve is at 0.86 for it's essentially 20 protein that are secreted from the aortas. Now, you have to recognize that all the genetics that have been done aren't even at 5% risk, because proteins matter. What the proteins and their proteoforms are, whether or not they're modified, truncated, whether or not they're actually an isoform that's unique, is what is driving your physiology at that time. And if you talk about being able to be precise, you better be precise on the uh, molecular phenotype. So I'm here to tell you that all the big data in the world does matter. It matters that it's precise, it matters that it includes proteomics and its modified forms and its isoforms and its protein complexes. And when we develop technology, when we develop te you know, disruptive technologies like I just talked about, you can now take biomarkers anywhere in this world, anytime, send it to our lab and we can tell you what's going on. When people invest in technology, that's disruption. That makes disruption at the level of concepts and break down dogmas. More importantly, it disrupts science and how we think about science. And if we're lucky enough, maybe that disruption on science will disrupt how we do medicine. And I think that's why we're all here today. Uh, whether or not you're a researcher, an investor, whether or not you're a technologist like me, if you care about our patients, care about yourself, then I think we want to be all on this journey together. So I have an awesome team. I work with awesome companies. Some of them you may or may not know uh, when you live in the world of ours. And I work with amazing people because that's how we actually get things accomplished. So thank you.